<laughs> to give Tyler a you know, informative response to my initial presentation. And again, I'd like to thank the participants and the audience, yourself, for remaining patient. I'd like to do some key points, first and foremost. Coming from a philosophy background, I, know, I think it's slightly intellectually unjust to agree to a title and address on the title. When we're talking about Islam or secular liberalism, and we focus on trying to speak about a certain form of liberalism, ignoring the secular framework in which critical liberalism sits within, I think it's problematic from an intellectual perspective when we come onto a common platform to discuss our philosophy and values, we must do them in a way that the audience can learn something rather than abstractly discussing Islam from a social and historical perspective without linking it to its philosophy. If you were attentive to my argument, you would have realized that what I do is first and foremost discuss the philosophical basis of values for secularism and liberalism and then show some practical examples in history. It doesn't mean though that there were there, there's, there's, everything is bad about secularism or liberalism, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is the problem we face in the UK, and in the US, and even in some Scandinavian countries that you mentioned, those problems are not aberrations, they're not accidents. They are as a result of secular liberal theory. This is my point. But luckily for the Muslim, when we look at our history, which has been very peaceful and sometimes very bloody, I agree. Those aberrations, I would argue, have been because we divorced ourselves away from the text of Islam. And this is something that needs you, not yourself, but many critics of Islam or any ideology need to be aware of. When we have a useful discussion, I'm not trying to preach here how to have a useful discussion. I think it's probably more positive from a discourse perspective in order to establish what are the values and underlying philosophy of liberalism and secularism. What are some problems and can we find a link? If we do, we have a good case. I think I did that. But yourself talking about Faber, talking about all those instances, without even providing the philosophy of values behind the situation of the political environment and context, I think it's quite damaging for yourself because it's like grasping at intellectual straws and trying to throw an argument in the air. And let me discuss some of these. First and foremost, before I discuss these, let me just argue that you did not address many of my premises. I know there was a lot, but I will give you a chance in the Q&A, and if this ends and we have to move away from PUB, I will give you my email address. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're lucky, maybe my number. <laughs> so, essentially the premises that you did not argue was when I said secularism is pegged on its history, and I quoted some political contemporary philosophers and gave some justification that it was a specific product of a specific environment, that you did not address. Also, the view on the self as a philosophical foundation for liberalism, individualism or atomism, as many political philosophers talk about, is that a correct view to be man? I don't care if some guy in Scandinavia is having a nice time. The problem is, philosophically, is it correct? We're talking about truth here. We're talking about, is this philosophy correct? And that's the issue. You did not address if individualism is ontologically correct or false. Second, the political ethics and morals. I think you did a bit of a tricky one there. Very tricky. MashaAllah. <laughs> I think the tricky one was is that I'm not saying that people who do not have God as a rational basis for their life are not moral. I'm not saying that. I'm not even saying how do we get to learn about morals. This is a testimony. I was talking about the ontological basis for morality which you didn't address, which you nicely sidelined. And I argue again, in secularism or liberal politics, because it divorces God from the political arena, you can never claim philosophically, from an ontological perspective, that you can have objective political ethics, objective morals. That for me is very troubling and dangerous. And the reason I mention the Holocaust is because outside of the God framework, all you have is peer pressure or evolution as a justification for morality. Now even if we take evolution, but we're just accidental byproducts no longer evolutionary process. Process. 
And what does animals, from an evolutionary perspective, that animals do not have a moral paradigm. And also morality is just an accident, just like our hands and feet or teeth, from an evolutionary perspective. So it has no objective moral grounding. The other point that you may want to argue is what about social pressure. There's a consensus. But again, all that calls for is relative political ethics and morality. That's why if America decides to wage to its crusade in the Muslim world, comma, cults, whatever you call these things, um, then, and there's a consensus in the American public because they've been duped by the political influentials and the social pressures in that society to say, yeah, fine, go and do your crusade, then according to the type of morality, it's okay to do so. Just like in the 1940s and 30s when there was a consensus in Germany that the Jews were a problem and the way we deal with them is X, Y, Z, well, that's fine. And that is in accordance with the, the secular philosophy of political ethics. You can't do that from a theistic or religious perspective on ethics because we believe morals are objective, not changing because of accidental byproducts of evolution process or because of peer pressure. That was the point. There's a difference between ontology and epistemology. Being a philosopher, professor, I think you know that. Also, with regards to when I was talking about Islam, case, the case of society, uh, the economic model, the principles I gave, let's not go outside of this debate is between Mr. Hamza and Dr. Hayna. Two nice guys, maybe one more handsome than the other. <laughs> but the point is, is that I gave a cogent case for the exam financial model. You need to address it. You can't say, no, it hasn't been tested. I've given you the philosophy principles. Test the ideas in the public square, which is here, which you still haven't addressed. So, these are, these are the main points which I think you have silent the debate, changing the debate, which I think is intellectually dishonest. And also some of the things that you addressed, you didn't differentiate between ontology and epistemology, and we had a bit of a crazy circle. But let's talk about some of the things you were talking about during your presentation. Now you were saying that there is mechanisms in liberal democracy to account rulers. I would disagree, practically and philosophically. Practically, in order to account a ruler in liberal democracies, you have to wait a bloody long time. You have to wait four years and you have to vote. I believe that is hugely problematic. Now, you are obviously ignorant of the Islamic concept of the court's unjust acts, which is a developed Islamic concept of accounting the rulers under the banner of commanding the ma'ruf and forbidding the mukha, which is commanding the good and forbidding the evil. And this court of unjust act is an independent judiciary outside of the khalif, the sultanate, Darul Salam, Khilafah, whatever you want to call it. And its job is solely to account the ruler. And it does it not by waiting every four years, it does it immediately. And anyone can do it, you don't have to be rich or poor. Because in liberal democracies, you have to be bloody rich to account the ruler. Because you have to pay for huge legal fees. And when you get under legal aid, for example, in some countries, it's problematic. Could you get a bloody rubbish lawyer? So the point is, is that under the Islamic concept, it's very transparent. Sister on my left, brother on my right, cameraman in the middle, can go to the Qadi of the unjust the courts of the unjust acts, and he could say, I have a huge problem with the future sultanate, for example, let's call him Ibn Adam, son of Adam. Son of Adam, you have been unjust, you haven't applied the just economic principles that you should be, you should be applying. And what happens is, the judge straight away counts the ruler, and there's a public forum. And I think that's more transparent, and more effective, and more practical than the liberal democratic one, because what you have to do, is you have to vote, and you have to wish and pray to God, if you believe in God, that everyone's going to vote the same as you're going to vote. And that's problematic. That's not accountability. That's like luxury for me. So that's why I think the Islamic model has trans more transparent mechanisms in order to account the ruler. The second point you were saying is that, look what happened in America as a practical perspective, Obama replaced Bush. Yeah, but the thing is, and I'm going to be quite controversial here, you can dress the devil as an angel, but you still get burned when you shake his hand. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, from the Muslim world perspective, or the, uh, the Arab world, and Lebanon is an Arab world, Obama has some very dangerous concepts. I know he has a very nice smile, 
and he's very handsome, he has this very good image, he has the sadness of liberal democratic politics these days, because it's all about political imagery. Do I have the suit, do I have the time, do I have the eloquence? But when we really look at their policies, and I challenge everybody in this room to look at the foreign policy of Obama, and you see some very, very dangerous things. For example, it's increasing the war effort in Afghanistan, so-called saying that torture was wrong, is actually got some legal loopholes, it's killing Muslims and many other human beings in North Pakistan, it's having a concentrated effort to kill innocents in Uzbekistan. We have all this, this, this talk of we're gonna have a new age, but frankly, if you don't change the ideology, you're not gonna change the foreign policy, and the foreign policy stays the same. Also, you mentioned about can a non-Muslim be the head of the Islamic State? No, they can't. And I would argue, can someone who's Muslim like me, advocating for Darul Salaam, land of peace under the Islamic principles and governance and the mechanisms from its political values, can I, for example, if I was living in Algeria a few years ago, and I wanted to elect myself, if you to elect me to call for an Islamic State, can that really happen under the liberal model? No, I can't. Because liberalism has a very clever mechanism. It says anything goes except for liberalism. And that's the problem. And secularism has the same problem too. It assumes that liberalism and secularism is right. And that's the problem. So just by you say, can a non-Muslim rule in Islamic State? No, because they have to understand the Islamic source text. For example, myself as a Muslim, and you did mention Muslims can engage in political affairs, but that's a different discussion. I'm talking about leadership. Can a Muslim who advocating for an Islamic political model, can they participate? No, because it's in Congress with the liberal and secular framework. And just like, and I think oh, there's no problem with this. For example, a communist man will never want to rule a capitalist nation. He just doesn't make any sense. So I don't think there's any problem here. And if you think this is unjust, it's actually not. It's actually very open and very conducive to positive politics. And I'll tell you why. What about women? Can women be? Okay, I mean, you have your chance to speak in a minute. I didn't interrupt you, so. Um, it's all fine, it's fine. I will discuss the women in a minute. Um, shall we? So, now if you remember what I was saying. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, the last half. Essentially, in Islamic political principles and liberal secular political principles, it's very simple. You can never challenge the source of law. Because the source of law in liberal secularism is the mind. You can never challenge the mind. You can never go in British Parliament and say, I believe the um, source of law must never be the mind. They'll say, bye bye, salamu alaikum, salama, see you later. Because the source of law in liberal secular politics is the mind. And it's never challenged, it's never debated. Just like in Islam, in Islamic politics, the source of law, source of politics is God. Do you see, and a Muslim or someone who advocates this type of politics will never question the source of law in the Islamic State. But they don't do that either in under liberalism and secularism, because it's always going to be in the mind. So I don't think there's a problem here in regards to, to ruling. And so since then, you have to adopt Islam ideologically in order to be a ruler. Then you're saying, well, can a Muslim woman be a ruler? Well, a Muslim ruler, woman probably has as much capacity to rule intellectually and in other ways. However, she's not allowed to rule. It doesn't mean she can't rule, there's a difference. So my point is this, is that with regards to gender issues, that's another topic now, but let me quickly just discuss this for you. See, under the liberal model, there's no social framework. There's no conception of the good, as you said. And you said there was failings for that, which was quite interesting because Dr. Hyder agreed with many things I said about liberalism, which I think is quite positive on, on my side. Islam has a social model. And what it does, it doesn't advocate this ridiculous reaction of this erroneous term of gender equality. What does this mean? If you read feminist theory, and I'm really into feminist theory, if you read the likes of Marion Friedman and Diana E. Russell, fantastic political theorists and the feminists. If you read them, you start to understand that women in the West have been oppressed, even if they feel liberated. Do you know why? Because man has become the yardstick. 
If man could do that, then I could do that too. And they haven't seen the reality of the individual, whether they're male or female. What they've done is they've emotionally and intellectually reacted to this concept of men could do that, therefore we must raise to that yardstick. But I would argue, why should a man be the woman's yardstick? That's problematic. And if we read books like Lisa Birkin in her works, The Life of a Working Mother, she says, I can't give 100% of myself to my family. I can't give 100% of myself to my work. And I can't give 100% myself to my, to my friends. So there is a growing problem in liberal Western culture because of this non-conception of the good. What Islam does, it just defines roles, defines roles and responsibilities. And everyone has their area. It doesn't mean a woman can't or doesn't have the capacity to lead. It's just her role is not to lead. Just like in many cases under Islam, the man can be seen to, uh, to basically have a very, uh, from a liberal perspective, an unjust role because he has to provide food, shelter, and clothing for the woman. The woman is economically liberated in an Islamic context. But I was arguing in a liberal context, they're not. You know, in Islam, if the man or someone who's caring for the woman cannot provide food, shelter, and clothing, the state does that. But if you look into Britain and America, Britain specifically, in 2007, there was 90,000 homeless homes many of which included women. I didn't see George Bush or Obama say, here, lady, missus, whoever she is, we need to have, have, have some shelter. Where Islam actually provides economic liberation for women and so forth. However, that's another discussion of gender rules. So just to quickly discuss that perspective. Also, you can't pick and choose liberal nations and say, look, these liberal nations are really good, and this is my model. Because what you've done again is you haven't been attentive to my argument. You need to provide a philosophy and show how this philosophy has produced the examples that you have given. You failed to do that. You just said it's a liberal model, therefore guilty by association. If something good is happening under liberal states in Scandinavia, therefore liberalism must be good. I think there's a logical fallacy here. Problem. What you need to do is show a liberal philosophy and provide a conceptual link on how your examples are linked to liberal philosophy. Because according to your argument, I could just spin it around and say the following. I could say that your example are the result of Islamic values. I could just say that. I could say the reason that certain liberal states may have cohesive societies is because they have religious values still in their society. It might have nothing to do with liberalism. Because I think I have shown that individualism and atomism propagate in society and have some social research evidence such as normative informational influence and informational social influence, etc. Uh, models of conformity and influence actually can affect, does affect society and they become overly individualistic. See, this is what I mean by having a nuanced discussion. You can't just say, here's a philosophy and here's a multiple example. I think what we need to do is show the values of philosophy, show the conceptual link, and provide a useful example. Just by providing examples it doesn't go out anywhere because I could turn the debate around and say, well that's because of, not because of liberal values, but because of religious values. Do you see the point? Also, you were talking about liberal economic model. Well, you said some nations might adopt liberalism as an ideology, but they might not adopt liberal economic model, they might adopt some more conservative strands of economic policy, etc. But I think that just proves my argument. Liberal economics has failed. Because when I talk about liberalism, I'm talking about social liberalism and economic liberalism. So you haven't provided a case for economic liberalism either. And if you want to talk about economic liberalism, well, it's very lovely fair. I'm all right. You know, free, this jungle of market economy is just free. Everyone can do what they like. And there's no mechanisms to prevent what's happened today, which is a huge financial crisis. And this is not just one off. This happens. Okay, average every 20 years, we had the dot-com crisis, we had the crisis in the 30s, and we had crisis before as a result of these laissez-faire approach to, to economics, you know, the free market economy. And if you look at Adam Smith, which is the modern father of the liberal economics, the, a late 18th century philosopher, he said basically trickle down economics somehow from the rich, the resources will trickle down to the poor. How? With no mechanisms? How is that going to happen? Surely you must believe in God for that to happen. And, what they call, and they call it in popular culture, they call it the, the horse and sparrow theory. Somehow, if you feed the horse a lot of oats, some oats will fall from its mouth on the floor and the sparrow will come to eat. So I think this problem is a liberal economic theory. But I haven't addressed everything, I think we could do that in the Q&A. 
But just to finalize, because I have about 30 seconds left, we haven't addressed any of my premises. Secondly, you have, when you try to address some premises, you haven't understood the difference between ontology and epistemology. Further, you've changed the debate just to liberalism, where the debate is actually secular liberalism. That's why you missed most of the secularism arguments that are provided. So I think in order for us to continue on the topic of the debate and to give justice to the money that people have paid to come here, actually came here for free. <laughs> we need to start laying on the lines of the debate, so please address my premises. Alhamdulillah. Thank you very much. Well, I, I think you've addressed uh, successfully or not, I'm not sure, most of the points I believe, except for the first one, but and I probably would have a chance to do so, whether you would, uh, an Islamic state would allow people to convert uh, from Islam to other religions, or whether you have to allow to have debates about God's existence in such state. Uh, if you allow yes, these things, of course, that, that would be, towards, you know, to some extent, towards the liberal model. Uh, but let me let me address the things that you have asked me to address, and I think that address and maybe you are partially uh, right. Uh, now, the issue of the individualistic basis of liberalism and secularism, where do I stand on these things? I think lots of what I call critical liberalism or advocate liberalism, do acknowledge that some level of common good must exist for societies to have a healthy uh, uh, structure and to be able to respond to challenges as well. Now, whether this requires abandoning liberalism, they don't think so, or secularism. Let me take an example. You said, what happened? What went right in the liberal state of Norway? You might say, oh, maybe because they're religious. No, actually. Norwegians tend to be less religious than, the, than, the, than people in the US, actually. There is less, belie uh, less believers in Norway than there are, there are in the US. So it can't be religion. What is it that makes a place like Norway or Sweden and Denmark, again, successful liberal countries? I think there are conceptions of the common, common good. People there are raised on ideas of common good. A common good of sharing a certain cooperative scheme. A common good of playing fair. So if you, if you uh, want to benefit from the goods by the state, and you want to be a fair person, you have to pay your taxes. You have to do your thing. If you want to have a clean country, you have to be, you know, not throw litter from your window. This is an appeal to a common good, Share, sharing the corporate project, enhancing the sense of fairness, the sense of duties to play your fair role in such schemes. These kind of values, the best compassion, for example, the best compassion, by the way, the highest percentage of contributions to uh, causes outside their country, poverty, uh, diseases outside, the highest percentage of capital per income of contributions in the whole world in Norway. Why is that? Not because of individualism, but because there are values being promoted in that society. The value of compassion is a value that people would like to promote. And they can promote without appealing to a particular religion. Maybe religions play a role in that. Nobody denies that. But can also be inculcated in society through education, through teaching, through examples, through, through community work, where people do help others in need. You can raise your children, your youngest in society, to be, to, to be able to see the values of these uh, common goods. Not only common within the country, but globally common goods. I think the popular demand for erasing uh, 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 the uh, African debt by, by European uh, countries is a drive based on that sense of compassion and sense of fairness. They think it's unfair to burden current African generation with bad policies of their uh, uh, predecessors who were probably also influenced by colonial 
destruction all of that. There is a sense of that going on. After all, the people who went out in the streets in Europe protesting the war in Iraq, we did not do that out of religious conviction. They did that because out of a sense of unfairness, that this will bring destruction to that country. These values can be inculcated in these countries despite them being secular and liberal. Now, come to the second question, which is the objectivity of morality, the epistemological and ontological question. This is a very complicated issue philosophically. How do people justify moral views? First, why is killing wrong? I happen to have my answer to that. I'm not think it's a very uh, probably convincing, you know, uh, it will not be sweep your feet off my answer. But I think if somebody says killing is wrong because God said so, I think this is the wrong answer. I think God said so because killing is wrong. I think if God were to change his mind, Tomorrow I say killing is right, I will not accept that. I think that if somebody is, if somebody doesn't, if somebody tells you, why should I believe that killing is wrong? How can you convince such a person that killing is not, is not wrong? Uh, is wrong? If he's not convinced, or she's not convinced. Somebody is burning his neighbor. Huh? Say, oh, what's wrong with burning my neighbor? Huh? There's nothing wrong with it. I think in this case, argument stops. I think you just simply have to call the police. No? I think at the bottom level, we are creatures who are capable, if we are normal, of seeing that this behavior is cruel. If you cannot see it as cruel, nothing will. Now, if on the other hand you say, you should not burn your neighbor because you will go to hell. That's a threat. So now we don't argue with him. Now we're giving him a threat. You will go to hell, God will send you to hell if you don't uh, burn your neighbor. I think, even if this will convince him not to burn his neighbor, it would be the wrong way of convincing him. You have not turned this person into a moral person. You have simply said to him, look, there is good consequences for that. You haven't shown him the immorality of it by showing that there is an authority that's going to inflict pain on him if he does so. I happen to believe that moral arguments come to an end. But the end, they come to arch are based on human nature. No matter how much you put a cat in front of other cats being burned, the cat will not develop the idea that this is cruel. Huh? But we humans, with slight training, we develop the idea of cruelty. And we, we see things as cruel. And I think this is not unique to morality, it's unique to language. No matter how much time you spend talking to a cat, she will not, she will not answer to you. But, you know, few years of talking to kids and they will master a language. I think our morality in that sense is hardwired in us as, as, as creatures. Now that's my philosophical point. Uh, of course, I know there are problems with it, like all philosophical views are problems, but I think there are also deep problems with what you might call the command, the divine command theory of morality. That it's right because God said so. And I, if you have time, we can, we can go into that. Now, the, the second thing, accountability and Islam. You said that I have not understood the uh, Islamic model. And that's probably right, because I haven't seen any. The ones practice, practice actually are flawed, as many people would say. Now, the one practiced by the Prophet is exceptional, because that was the Prophet. There you have direct access to God's command, and therefore you don't need to uh, uh, accountability. You don't need to have accountability for the prophet. Now, you after the prophet. What kind of accountability you are advocating? You are advocating that we can go to the Qadi. Now, immediately one would ask, who appoints the Qadis? Who appoints the Qadis? You know, we know many, in many dictatorships, the Qadis get appointed by, by the dictator, you know, because they know what happens to them if, they're, if they, if they uh, do what the, what the ruler doesn't want to. You go to the Qadi, and the Qadi is courageous, gives a sentence against the ruler. Huh? Who's going to enforce the sentence? The police. Huh? Who commands the police? The ruler. The ruler, again. <laughs> I mean, you have, I'm not saying that democratic accountability is perfect. It's far from being perfect. But definitely, it's much worse to have it all in the hands of the ruler. Huh? Who would, with time, become corrupt? 
probably would like you to get these kids inherit the, the seeds, as it happens in most Islamic states. The most successful stable Islamic states were based on inheritance, not on qualification. Of course, sometimes you get, because of genetic luck, rulers who are quite good. Huh? Uh, and you know, in this case, you hit the jackpot, yeah? <laughs> you know, with people like Cinema the Magnificent and others. And sometimes you get the, you know, uh, uh, lousy ones. Uh, but first of all, if you say, "Oh, we're going to have a council that would select the ruler," of course, well, I'm a ruler and I have a council. What do I do? I select the council who will select my son to be my. Uh, I make sure that they or whatever my 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 cousin. Now, how can you avoid such abuse of power? By diffusing power. The best way to diffuse power is to have more people have an input in that. It's much less, it's much more difficult to be able to control your country in this way. This is a basic, basic way of ensuring uh, against abuse of power. With all the problems, the flow of democracy. Yes, if you are rich, you have access more to the media. If you are this, you, you have a more chance of, of getting what you want. The legal system might favor pe people over others. But then again, if you are a party and I'm a ruler, and I say, look, there's a case coming to your side, uh, I would like you to judge in favor of uh, my cousin. Huh? What power do you have as a party to say no? You might be a decent party, but then if you're too decent, maybe with time they, get, they find a way to get rid of you. I mean, what mechanism do you have? In, in European liberal, liberal countries, you have independent judiciary. Huh? You have accountability. Now, because also you can appeal to the public, you can appeal to the, to the parliament. There's a debate in, in place like in the UK where there is a whole bench of MPs waiting for errors done by the ruling uh, party to, you know, basically attack them. That's how we ensure accountability. Not by having this, this kind of, supposedly, you would say, transparent. Yeah? And nothing transparent in it. Now, uh, again, you know, uh, uh, you know, on the issue of Muslims being president and women, let me start with women because I think you're weaker on this side. On this side. <laughs> you know, he said, okay, what? women will not want to be rulers. So, okay, fine, if they don't want to be rulers, they will not run for office. No? Why not allow them to run for office if nobody wants to be a ruler? I don't want to be a ruler. Nobody forces me. I think it's a lousy job. Huh? Some woman like Rahim Hassina of, 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 of Bangladesh wants to be a ruler, and she's a good, decent ruler. Why not allow her to be a ruler? Uh, it doesn't make a difference. And I said, man is the yardstick of woman. I think if, suppose I agree. Man, 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 man in the river country is the yardstick and should not be. This is what you think. Yeah? Yes. Now, now I think, suppose that's the case. Suppose you raise women not to have man as the yardstick. Fine, if they come out of this not wanting to run for office because they don't see man as it, then they will not run. But you give them the option. What if women like to? Uh, and they're talented at it. Well, what's their, you know, I, th I think even it doesn't do your cause well to insist on that part of that standing. Uh, one, I think there should be some flexibility and say, okay, why not? Women can become rulers if they show. Uh, I mean, that, that's that's a that's part which I don't think it would harm. I think uh, an Islamic outlook say women should. Now, when it comes to non-Muslims, to non-Muslims becoming rulers, you're saying, and I think you know that's a good answer to some extent. I mean, in the sense that can a, a communist. Uh, Run, uh, uh, run for office in a capitalist country, or up vice versa. Of course, as you know, there were communist country, co communist parties in capitalist societies. Huh? Uh, there was a communist party in France, a communist party in, in, in Italy, and they were running for, for office. And if they win the parliament, they would actually, they would govern. What does that, what's the difference? The difference is that communist, liberal communists, there are non-liberal communists. The liberal communists, and, and maybe that's also, if you are a non-liberal communist, if you say, okay, once I get into office, no elections from now on, I'm the ruler. <laughs> then, then of course, then of course this, this, this is a problematic platform. But if you ensure that you're allowing people to vote on this, then a communist platform could win. And then you will have 
certain policies about labor, about uh, privatization, they will reverse this, uh, these policies. I think the Labour Party uh, before Thatcher and England in general was a more or less socialist country. And after Thatcher became more, became more new liberal, uh, adopted new liberal uh, uh, economics. Now, the difference when it comes to religion is that if I am a non-Muslim, now if you tell me if you are not Muslim but you want to govern through Islamic law, I said, okay, what is the law itself? Does the law prevent non-Muslims from governing? Then I think it's unfair law. They are second-class citizens here. Do you think I should become a Muslim to have a chance to uh, 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 run for office? Or, you know, executive office? Then why should that be uh, 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 a necessary step for, for being a running? Then you have a society with first-class citizens and second-class citizens. Now, if you tell me, yes, that is what Islam does. It turns some citizens to first class because they have, they are the prime citizens, and there are those who are tolerated. They're not prime citizens, but they're tolerated. They can do whatever they want unless they don't interfere in public or at least margin the public in the public space. Now, if that's the case, then you have a you have a society with first class citizens and second class citizens. I don't think this is healthy. I don't think this is fair. Now, uh, now. Uh, After this, we will initiate the q and in I think Dr. Haib hasn't listened to my rebuttal to his first response again. So we have to be very attentive to argumentation. When you say that these liberal countries have cohesive societies because they are propagating a conception of the good, that is actually an illiberal concept. So what you have done is you have changed liberalism into something else just to suit the argument. Now according to the logicians, if you remove the essence of something, that thing changes to be the thing we were talking about. So what you've done to liberalism is you remove part of its essence which it does not talk about the conceptions of the good life. And you're saying, here's another model that does talk about conceptions of good life, therefore liberalism is right. But what you've done is you remove the defining feature of liberalism, which we saw according to political philosopher Will Kimmerich, when he says the defining feature of second liberal states, and you do not have the conception of good life. So I think your argument actually supports my argument, which is liberal societies cause non cohesive societies. Because you have just said, we need to change the premise of liberalism, we need to change the definition of liberalism, which is instead of calling for the good life, instead of not calling for the conception of the good life, let's call for it now. So you change definitions in order to an argument which I think is incorrect. And if you call this critical liberalism, then I think that's problematic also, because we need to draw our line in our yardstick. What, what are we actually calling for? Because critical liberalism is just a fanciful term for let's see, things, let's see how things go. And I don't think that's adequate as a fundamental basis for political philosophy. Also, you were talking about Norwegian people and what they do. And that's again, you're not in attention to the argument. There's a difference between mass populace, the people, and political theory. We are talking about political theory. We're talking about secular liberalism, or secularism and liberalism, however, which way you to take it. Just saying that some Norwegian people are really good, well that has nothing to do with liberalism, it's to do with because they may be people, they may have religious values, they may not. It has nothing to do with this. There's a difference between political philosophy and what people do. You still have to provide the link between liberalism and the positive nature of people in Norway or Sweden, for example. So again, we need to be attentive to the way we argue about these things to get a clear picture. Also, you're saying non-Muslims will be second-class citizens. 
I think that's, that's a bit cheap coming from someone who's advocating liberalism because it's liberalism that actually has facilitated the, new, the neo-modern form of second-class citizenship, which is the working class. If you go to Britain or America, you have people in poverty. If you look at the statistics in America, 25% of the population lives underneath the poverty ladder. And our poverty is, poverty is relative. However, this is a damning statistic. So in essence, you have second-class citizenship here with regards to practical realities. In terms of rights, I would disagree that under the Islamic model, you have second-class citizenship. What you do actually have is an elevated status of the non-Muslim. Because the non-Muslim doesn't have to partake in warfare or anything like that. His taxes are actually lower than the Muslims. So if you were to take it from that perspective, there is second-class citizenship, but the second-class person is actually the Muslim. Because he has to pay... Well, Muslims are fine with it, so the definition of fairness, if Muslims are okay with it, then it's okay. So, from that model, so from that model, from that model, uh, actually non-Muslims get elevated status. And that is because Islam wants to make its model attractive to people, so they either could accept Islam, because essentially, from a theological perspective, Islam says you need to follow Islam as a way of life in order to attain eternal bliss. Otherwise, you will get eternal damnation called hell. This is the reality of religious discourse. However, in, even if someone rejects that, they say, fine, live peacefully under the peace and values of Islam. And you were talking about the Qadi, who appoints the Qadi. But you missed a term that I used. I said the Qadi must be external to the state, he must be independent. And he's not appointed by the ruler. There's a concept in Islam called, to translate it in English, is the community of the people. And these people have actually a role on the banner of commanding the ma'roof, forbidding the munkar, commanding the good and forbidding the evil. And these people can be Muslim and non-Muslim, and they can actually challenge the Qadi himself also. And that's why I said it's more transparent, because you still have other layers of accountability, which we could discuss the whole model, especially during the Q&A. So I think your argument failed to give the true picture there. And in order just to, just to finish, because I think it's, it, would be, it would be only fair, it, it would be only fair for people to have questions and answers. You're saying, can people discuss the existence of God in the Islamic State? People were even discussing the authenticity of the Quran under the Islamic State. We have, alhamdulillah, over 1100 years of intellectual discourse and scholarship. The only thing that we disagree with is that when you do talk to people, couch it in language that's conducive to debate and dialogue. Because this neoliberal term of freedom of speech, which they call freedom to insult, is actually goes against the very objectives of freedom of speech in the first place. If you read the works of Thomas Paine and the early, if you like, the prophet of liberalism, um, um, John Stuart Mill, he says you can't couch your language in offensive language because you're going against the very purpose of discourse in the first place. If I had President Bush in front of me and I wanted to count him by saying you have the intellectual capacity of a monkey, this is not good accountability. You have to couch it in terms and language as appropriate. Similarly, in Islamic discourse, people were debating the existence of God and the authenticity of the Quran more times than they done in a liberal society. This is how flourishing the intellectual activity was under Islamic governance because what it does, it propagated terms like pondering and contemplation. And the Quran says, oh, Do they not reflect within themselves? This concept of in classical language is not being a desert romantic touching the sand and looking at the stars. It actually has huge connotations. The thing that you're meditating upon, that you're that you're discussing upon, that you're debating upon, you must acknowledge or look at its implications. So intellectual discourse was right under Islamic. Now, I don't know how we see, you know, we have this false dichotomy. In order to have intellectual activity, you must be liberal. And anything other than that must be oppressive. This is a false dichotomy because what people do in the Western tradition, or those uh, educated in the West, they take and superimpose a European construct of church oppressing people and they superimpose it on the Islamic narrative. I think that's unfair. It's also a logical fallacy taking something specific and making it general. So if we do look into Islamic history, we see some different things. So I would argue just for the sake of Q&A, let's be more attentive to argumentation, discuss values and link them to our practical realities.
and they just love the hair. Thank you. Another final statement will be given by Bashar Haider. Before Bashar Haider, and then we will begin the Q&A. This is fine now. Thanks to the patience of this. Uh, now, uh, if what we can locate is, is, is the following picture of this Islamic state, that he's partial, that you can, this Islamic state, declare your atheism, you might have a, a party of atheist people, and you can convert from Islam to this party or to other religions. That's the kind of uh, uh, model that the Islamic State has created. I have no problem with that. I think why do I have no problem with that? Because of the liberal court, liberal values. Of course, I think people should have the right to choose. Now, critical liberalism, why is it liberalism? Because it's not going to abandon the value of free choice. Of course, it seems that there might be, in some form of liberalism, to extreme individualism and for amends for that uh, failure, but it does not abandon the core of liberalism, which is the value of free choice. If your static state is going to have these, this free choice secured, then at least in that respect, it fits the liberal model I advocate. Again, if you are allowed in this Islamic state to convert from Islam to something else, if you are allowed to declare your atheism as well as to form parties based on these, uh, or groups, religious or religious groups, and based on these things, then that's fine with me. Historically, there has been intellectually vibrant uh, 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 scene in Islamic history. However, however, it was not allowed to declare atheism. And none of the Muslim scholars, who were some of them accused of being secret atheists, like the Razi and others, huh? they accused of being secret atheists because they, their, their doctor, even Ibn Rush was accused, I think in this case probably falsely, of being uh, a, 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 a secret atheist. Because in fact he says that, that the common people should not know the right reason. You should give them what's suitable for them. So people suspected that maybe he's, he's an atheist, but advocating that he's a Muslim just to have access to the people. Now in these things, why were people suspected of being an atheist? Because it was not allowed to declare that you are an atheist. If you think in your Islamic state you are advocating, you have the right to, 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 to do that, you have the right to advocate your Muslim, you have the right to actually preach your atheism or your Christianity to other to, to Muslims and leave them to decide whether they want to buy your merchandise or not, then I have no problem with that Islamic model in that respect. Now, it comes to something I forget to mention before. Then again, it is very important to separate liberalism from neoliberal economic model. The main advocate after John Stuart Mill, and, and John Stuart Mill himself was in favor, not in favor of the neoliberal model of economics, but the main advocate after John Stuart Mill of liberalism is John Rawls. And John Rawls is famous for his extremely egalitarian theory of tax and distribute, give to the poorest from those who are wealthiest. These are pillars of, liberal economy, of liberalism that did not endorse neoliberal economy. These share only the name of the, the, the civil liberalism, but in fact, there's nothing else shared by that. I think this is very important to distinguish between liberalism, secular liberalism, the ability for them to choose their own beliefs, doctrines, style of life, versus the issue of taxation and distribution of wealth. Second, the last, the issue of war. And I think, if you think they are elevated, non-Muslims, because they are given privileges and you don't have to go to war. You know, this is very problematic, you know. If it's a privilege, leave it again to them to decide. If they want, if you say, look, if you go to war, you pay uh, more tax, less taxes, whatever it is, you choose. What if I want to go to war? I'm not Muslim, but I want to defend my country. I mean, why should that be... Uh, if, it's, if it's about if it's about obligation, if I don't expect from you as a non-Muslim to defend your country, I don't make it mandatory on you, then I'm assuming that this country doesn't mean to you as much as it means to the Muslim. You have less stake in it. You know that defending your country would be part of showing how, how much this is your country. 
You're not simply a resident there. Who doesn't go to war in England? Uh, if there is a war, if there is a draft for war. Those who are not English, they happen to be living there. Students, uh, work, temporary workers, temporary residents. If you are part of that country, then you share all the burdens and benefits of that country. I, don't, I would still think you would be a second class citizen if you uh, 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 not allowed to, to fight. And also, if you are not forced to fight like the others, if, if others are imposed on them fighting, then the assumption, why are you imposing on them fighting? Because in order to substantiate your claim, I never said they're not allowed to fight. Okay, fine. Well, but I said what they don't have to fight. Don't have to fight. was funny. Is many of them chose to. Yeah, yeah, but even this, not, not making it an obligation for them to fight, is also indicates that they have, the, they have, they don't have the same obligations. And if they don't have the same obligations, it's not their country to the same degree. Why don't they have the same obligation? It's because they have the same relationship with the country, but they don't have the same obligation. It's just a privilege for them because for no good reason. If you don't give them this obligation as well, it's also indicative that they do not stand in the same relationship to this country as others, which either it makes them first class citizens, and the Muslims become second class citizens, which you don't want to say that, or it makes them second, which I think is the case. It makes them second class citizens. If they are equal, they should have the same obligations, the same requirements on all of them. That would still be discrimination. Even ele elevating non-Muslims would be discrimination if it's elevation. It would be still discrimination. Thank you. Okay, finally now I'm going to see a Q and finally. My question is to Mr. Hamza, you, you compared the, um, the role of the mind as, uh, as a source of law to the role of God as a source of law. Now, I personally consider that that's a kind of, you know, a flawed analogy uh, because I, I think you're wrong because you can't question the mind if the mind is right or wrong 